cool, cool. All right. Hey. And it says we're live on Facebook, even though it says it's preparing. So I never know whether it is. But now we're live. Yeah, now we're live. It's great. Just so. <laughs> uh hello everyone uh i'm randy dixon artistic director of unexpected productions and uh thank you for coming to this up close um with me today is andrew heffler who is the uh, founder artistic director of uh, grund theater in budapest hungary and we'll talk about the scene there and whatnot uh but he's an expatriate from i don't know why they call it expatriates actually i don't uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk about that but uh, anyway so he's here but before i talk to andrew uh, i want to talk to you guys who are watching and um but you know we have four live shows that we're doing right now we're hoping to expand and next week washington state where we're located in seattle um is opening up so we're going to try to get as many shows as we can up and running get back to normal as much as we can um in addition to that in the fall we will have uh an online show as well uh that's just online so look for that um anyway the shows we have wednesday we do our duo show uh friday and saturday right now we're doing theater sports and sunday is an open improv show so come check that out next week on Thursday, uh, we're doing Pride Night, um, and we'll have various guests. It's going to be a really nice night uh, coming in and celebrating Pride Month. So uh, come and see that. Also, we have classes coming up in July. And if, uh, as you're watching, Andrew and I uh, doing our pithy conversation, I um, <laughs> want to make a donation, uh, you can also find out about that and all this stuff at unexpectedproductions.org. So go there and uh, yeah, sign up for a class, buy a ticket to a show, give a donation, that would be great. So that's the commercial. I'll remind you a little bit more at the end, but uh, for now I have uh, Andrew Heffler. So, uh, wow, thank yeah. you. You know, I, I should preface this because some people who have watched this on a regular basis, we had this scheduled um before and then you did not want to do it so badly that you decided to catch covid yep. um to get out of it uh i you know i took it to such an extreme i look i'll be honest i had a lot of anxiety about saying yes to this and i just i opted for what was at hand actually i'll be honest i, I needed any i was grasping for excuses um yeah. uh, yeah, so, was, I mean, but, but, took, took a tango with the uh, with the coronavirus. Um, right. And what yeah, was I, what was that like? Talking yeah, well, I would say COVID suffer. Mm, yeah, I would say if you have the chance, opt no. Um, I would just opt out of that at any chance you get. I I personally had a terrible spell with it and uh, did not like one second of it. Nothing redeemable for me for the most part. Uh, the kids brought it back from school. So they opened up our school for the first time, I guess, since December. It was the first week of March. The kids brought it back to us. They shut the school within two days because a lot of people got ill. Uh, the kids were symptom free. My wife got ill. And then with a few days, uh, within a few days, she kind of got herself back on her feet. Uh, I fell ill. Right. And then I took it real serious. I guess I, I decided to go all in for it. And, uh, and it took me about six weeks, I would say to wow. to kind of be able to declare that i'm feeling pretty much back to normal um right. a spell in the hospital and all of that stuff so i i really i guess i i took it a little too seriously but uh yeah i did. committed you, you were all in I, I'm committed. I, absolutely right <laughs> i hope i hope that i can commit to scenes like i did this um yeah but if anybody out there was possibly doubting it, and I know that there's a lot of people who get off pretty easily with this, and we know that that this particular illness can be selective, and we also know that there's great vast gradations of how ill people get. But I would say opt no if you can, um, because it is, uh, yeah, I, I would have to say there were days where I felt unlike I've ever felt before. 
Um, yeah, truly, I, I truly felt the headaches and I felt the kind of the, the dis kind of just in absolute kind of mental disarray and, you know, physically just, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's a really tricky thing. And I, we were pretty cautious about it. I mean, we, we basically took it seriously in the sense that wanted to be cautionary, try to live our lives as, as we could and still have as much quality of our of life as we could, but we wanted to be sensitive to people around us and ourselves. And uh, I still think I grossly underestimated it. I really do. <laughs> I do. And our a neighbor of ours, who's a dear friend, came to me a couple of weeks ago. We were over at his house and he said to me, when I heard how ill you were, was shamefully was the very first time that I actually understood the severity of this. And I thought that if it's true for him and he's pretty dialed in for the most part, right. I thought that's gotta be true for a lot of people. I think people are in denial, you know, and, and happily so that, you know, even if you're intellectually acknowledging it, there's part of you that's really trying to keep separate from it. Right. Wow. Yeah. So you're a couple months removed now from yeah. the virus. Um, and what's the situation for Budapest? Is it opening up? And especially around obviously theater performance, uh, or is it still kind of cautious and shut down? I mean, here again, next week we're opening up totally. So right. we'll see what happens, but. Yeah, well, I think similarly, so the US has pretty good numbers for vaccines. And I think that there's a lot of optimism, even if it's cautious optimism. And I think that that's reflected in Hungary. Again, the numbers for vaccines, vaccinated people are pretty high. And uh, the numbers for people getting the illness are really down, uh, especially as compared to what they were in February, March, April. So I think that that's what's happening. And you're seeing it, you're seeing venues open up. So concerts are coming in. I don't know this. I think there's still size controls. So they're not quite going into let's have, you know, tens of thousands of people at a festival. Right. But we're hearing more and more about it. Um, I also play music. I mean, I'm in a band. So we're. I would say normally we may have 15 or 20 concerts in a summer. It seems this summer we have about six or eight. So I, I'm using that as a litmus that there's cautious optimism and certain things happening. Right. Cool. And the theaters are seasonal here, kind of a bit unlike they are in the States. So summer is usually summer theater or kind of your traditional city theaters aren't really operating. Right. Um, so we're the kind of the same thing. We'll, we'll have some theater performances in at festivals most of those things will be outdoors or in kind of amphitheater type things so we you know we'll see what the summer brings for that but we are definitely unlike last year we're kind of putting ourselves in motion to get things up and running for a fall start for theater right cool. yeah yeah we're looking forward to it too all right so um one thing i do with uh these interviews is they usually well and I always say I usually, and then I correct myself every, every time I do these interviews. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious uh, to know, like, where and when did you find improv? Mm. Uh, or did improv find you? Um, and what was it that drew you to it initially? So like the origin story. The origin story. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, for me, it it's kind of a, yeah, I, I would... It's hard to say. I would say, in a way, I found improv. Uh, I, I've be, but that's because I kind of came back to it. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I had a really unique teacher. He had kind of gr he'd grown up in Chicago, and he was uh, this single guy who moved out to California. And he was pretty young, I guess. He was maybe in his mid to late thirties at the time. He was teaching fifth grade at at the school that I went to, the grade school I went to. And one thing that he'd kind of grown up in a drama daycare in Chicago, which turned out to be the kind of Neva Boyd, Viola Spolin, uh, right. like, you know, sp spawned drama schools for, for day school kids and whatnot. And so his concept was that he wanted to use what he called creative dramatics as kind of a core sensibility or a core thing in all teaching. And so we called it creative dramatics. And so that meant that there were a few hours a week allotted for specifically creative dramatics, where we would improvise scenes, he would give us games and techniques, or we would prepare sketches and perform them for each other. And then he also would use that sensibility, even maybe in 
teaching literature or reading or any of those sorts of things. So he was really into that. He was reading books to us. Maybe we, he read like parts of Le Morte d'Artour to fifth graders or Sounder, maybe a book uh, that I remember having him read to us. He was showing us VHS copies of, of Saturday Night Live that had just gone on Saturday, He'd bring them in and show a sketch comedy that was permissible to show to 10 year olds for that or whatever. <laughs> and so that got my passion going for it, but it normalized it for me as well. So there was, I just saw it as it's the way I loved being in his class. Uh, most people did that were in his class. He was a very, you know, popular teacher. He was awarded by all sorts of different, you know, local and state awards and et cetera. So he was really this kind of lauded teacher and he normalized that. So we'd even perform theater, you know, for the other kids, we'd go around to school and we even improvise, but that was it. And so after fifth grade, it was kind of like I moved on and then he was doing maybe some summer camps or summer drama camps, summer drama camps. And by the time I was 12 or 13, I'd gone back and I was maybe one of his assistants or something. So I dabbled in it still and I knew this stuff, but it wasn't really until probably I was 18, 19, 20 that, uh, that I got into the idea of performing more consistently on stage. So I kind of went back to improvisation and, and started taking, uh, workshops or classes with different people that, you know, there was a lot going on. Los Angeles had a pretty decent scene, even, uh, even in the eighties and nineties, if maybe improvisation was, wasn't as prevalent as it is now, you still could find things. I right. went to UC, there were groups that were doing it there. And so that sort of thing. So I, I kind of had it and then I went back to it. And once I went back to it, it, it was something that stuck with me. It's yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, you're right, the 80s and 90s in LA, there was a very vibrant scene, but you've also worked with, you know, you've worked with Keith Johnson, and Gary Austin, and people yeah. like that. Um, yeah. So uh, what pushed you to say work with those guys or to go deeper and deeper and deeper? So you, you had it, you refound it, and then yeah. like a lot of people would dabble, but it seemed like you went deep. Um, and so I'm just wondering what, what the call was, I guess. Well, I, yeah, it, it was, a, it probably stemmed from a conversation I had with a really, uh, old dear friend of mine that I was performing. So I perform music. I'm a singer and I was playing in a band with this gentleman, uh, another American living here in Europe. And I had, I was working at a, at an international theater in Budapest. And I'd been doing, I'd been playing in some of the summer shows there and some of the plays, so traditional theater, um, meaning rehearsed theater and, and that sort of thing. And one of the people there asked me if there was a group of actors who were gonna go to India for the summer and tour a couple of shows. And they were worried about their language skills and they were worried about a few things. And so the, the director of the show asked me if I'd run a workshop for them. And I thought, oh God, I mean, I don't think I've ever really done that. This is probably 1995, 96, but I had an idea of, of some exercises, some, thing, some things to do. And I did it and I just felt clunky about it, but I felt like I had some idea and it was a lot, awful lot of fun to do, but I didn't feel 100% confident doing it. Uh, the actors loved it. And so, it, you know, it's like one of those def definition of a great circus trick. It's like, <laughs> it looked incredible. It felt great. There actually wasn't a hell of a lot of skill involved. You know, it's like, right. So in this particular, it was like a cheap and easy circus trick. But a friend of mine was talking to me one time, this is maybe a couple of years after this. And he just said, he said, uh, have you made your decision yet? And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And he says, your career. And he says, what? And I said, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're, you know, you're teaching at school. I was teaching drama at a grade school and you're, you're teaching that you're doing that, but you're, you're a performing artist. Are you going to be a performing artist? And, uh, and I, had, I don't think I'd ever really thought of that question that way. Right. And right. so I just started thinking back to all these things. And I said, yeah, I guess, you know, I guess I am going to be a performing artist. Um, and, and I was fortunate, I was fortunate to have a wife who kind of went all in on that with me because she was like, yeah, look, that's it. To me, it's kind of obvious. And I, whether that is or isn't the case and whether that is or isn't exactly what happened, I think that's what made me make the deep dive. So that's probably when I was already working in theater, improvising with the trio. 
um, I just wanted to have more understanding and more knowledge. I wanted to, I was running workshops, but I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to do it with, with a greater kind of understanding and, and command. So I, I went back and that's when I started going, spending time with Keith because Keith was coming to Europe frequently. And so I, I started spending time with Keith and the trio that I was in, Scalabouche with my dear friend, Ben O'Brien, who you've met and, and played yeah. with as well, lovely guy and a dear, dear friend, and great improviser. And Alexis Latham, another you know great improviser and actor. The three of us worked on stuff and we tried to innovate shows and and I I just wanted more vocabulary for that. And the more hungry I got for that and the more desire I had for that, um, I think it just led me further and further down you know, that, that road. Um, right. And yeah, and it just became a necessity too, right? Because it's like, right. they're just, you know, workshops needed to happen and people wanted to do stuff. And I, I wanted to be better and better at it. I wanted to be able to transform and, right. and, and know how to do it with, you know, with, with greater understanding. So I think that's as, yeah, for whatever it's worth, that's, that's what it was. Right. Well, I have a gigantic question, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll leave and you can just talk for the rest. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so, um, but, you know, the, the founding of Grun Theater and in, in Budapest and in the scene in Hungary. And later on, we'll talk about, you know, because the, the festival that you guys put on uh, that I was fortunate to, uh, to be a guest at and to teach at. Uh, I want to talk about sort of the whole Eastern Europe scene. But it's yeah. still that kind of cloudy, shadowy kind of like, what's going on over there? What, what's happening there? So uh, my gigantic question is sort of how did you decide to do this in Budapest? What was mm. the scene like? And now yeah. kind of what's the, obviously with COVID different, but prior to COVID, where was the scene at in terms of Hungary? Is it, is it alive? Is it, you know, nah, there's not so much. There's a lot. It seems to me like there's a lot, but I'll let you answer the question. Yeah. Well, I, I think the one of the big decisions was that we're going to stay in Budapest once my I my wife once we got married my wife and I and within a year and a half or two came our first kid and I think we kind of felt we would settle into Budapest even if there were kind of callings to maybe go somewhere else and I I felt there was already there was one young uh, improvisation theater company here existing. And I think, you know, some of these guys as well, you've met them over the years, La Venta and Juji, yeah. uh, Montan theater company and people that we've known since, you know, since the beginning, basically, um, meaning that Scalabouche, the theater, the trio that I was in, we were performing in English and then already performing improvisation in the nineties here. Um, but they started the first consistent Hungarian language improvisation theater company. And they, they got off to a really good start and it, they seemed to be attracting a lot of interest. And I was doing more and more workshops and there became a really strong demand to have the workshops in Hungarian. Uh, so there was, there was burgeoning interest in the, in the whole thing. And that's kind of what solidified the choice there because I, I basically turned an open workshop into, there became a demand that people wanted to have a theater company. So I've, I'd been doing some summer camps and, and some open workshops. And then, you know, there were six or eight or 10 of these people. They were even more consistently coming, but they wanted a theater company. So we decided this was about 2008, nine. Um, so we decided to found the theater company based on that. And I think the, the idea or the principle at that point in time was that theater is so beloved in this part of the world. And, there's such a theater going sensibility here. It's really part of the cultural fabric. It's part of a norm. And improvisational theater was scarce in a lot of ways, comparatively. And so I felt that there was moment on and there really wasn't a lot of other things going on. And I felt that there was, there could be a little bit more of a scene. And I think we were right. I think we really developed a lot of interest and people were particularly interested in coming to classes and coming to workshops and having an alternative type of theater to look at. So that's that's kind of how the decision got made for me. Um, that, and and a lot of it was just, you know, I I don't know how all these origin stories go, but it's it's kind of like the the company wanted kind of wanted to find to found itself in a way. It was just there was enough interest and enough people had been in drama clubs or drama camps or we had a couple of actors or actresses who had 
not kept up with the craft, but just wanted to come back to it, that sort of thing, it just put enough interest from the outside to put stuff on stage. I, I remember you, you often ask a good question, I think, right at the beginning of workshops when you say, what is the reason I want to improvise on stage, right? And I think that's a really, really important question. And I think when I started finding enough people who said, I want to improvise on stage because I, I want to be a performer and I want stories to be told on stage, and I think improvisation is a meaningful and useful way to do that. Um, then we started thinking, yeah, okay, we can do that. And actually interesting, I think with the times, other companies started popping up. Uh, there was a satellite company in one of the university towns in the South, another really good group of people who were kind of from a drama club in high school in the West, and they started a festival. And so a synergy started happening. And it seemed that something was quite, you know, burgeoning and coming together. And, and, uh, and so that was good. And that, that I think lasted. And as you know, it's hard for companies to be stable. Um, but I, that was lasting and that, that went all the way up to the pandemic where I think things were actually kind of solidifying and we'll see, we'll see if what kind of punch in the nose these guys took with the pandemic. <laughs> um, I know we, we scaled down, but actually we were able to kind of grow and solidify a few things, especially in education workshops and working on getting our festival kind of funded and networking with other uh, organizations in other countries near us. So for us, for example, I feel wasn't great that we had to shut down the theater and stop the shows, but I do think we made hay the way we could with the circumstances. Right. right. Uh, and I'm hoping that some of the other guys did. Uh, one of the groups in the West just said that there's gonna be, they're gonna put their festival on in August. So I think it's, it's promising. I would say that it's probably not as advanced as maybe Austria, certainly not as advanced as Germany. Poland is obviously a really good sized country with a lot of improvisation going on. So it's be hard to compare to that. But uh, yeah, I would say that, I'd say that the quality is good and improving. And I'm, I'm interested to see if the solvency is gonna remain after the pandemic. That's, cool. yeah. Yeah, great. Cool. Now I'm going to totally shift gears because uh, one of the points of the interview is I want to pick your brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in terms of your experience and your knowledge. Um, so, as a teacher in general, or as a performer in general, because you're traveling around doing different things, so not just in Hungary, but um, but European scene, and also you know, I mean, obviously you travel around and do stuff. Um, I'm wondering what what's like a key thing that you find yourself going to at the beginning of like almost every workshop. Like key thing is to make sure everyone gets this right out, you know. And in a way, it kind of talks to what's missing, I guess, in improv or what you feel like improvisers just don't get this. Uh -huh. you know? Like I was struck when you were talking about um, theater. Um, in Europe, because I think that's one thing, and I could be totally wrong, but in my experience, in North America, we don't necessarily think about theater. We think about films and TV and, you know, that stuff. But I do get a sense of that when I'm traveling in Europe, for sure. Like, wow, this is a theater audience. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, but anyway, in your own experience and in your own classes, what's like that one thing where you kind of go, got to make sure they get this right away? Mm. That's a great question. I. I will try to single it down to one and then I'll go with like buyer's remorse after this. <laughs> <laughs> but what what suddenly popped into my head, and it's according a little bit to the way you frame this, I believe that the the stage is it, it needs to be a dangerous place. Mm -hmm. And and I think and it's a ritualized space because we have permission to do a lot there, right? To, we have a permission to reveal a lot there. We have a permission to examine, look at, uncover. And I think a lot of times when that's trivialized or if that is, you know, folly or just left to folly, I think that we, we all might leave there feeling okay, but I think we've left there not really using or utilizing what it's for. And I think, so then I translate this. So I would say that I really want people to come off and say, I think this is, it's such a safe space that you've really got to take huge risks here. And then I think it should translate to the individual performer as 
you've really got to be willing to get this wrong. You've right. really got to be willing to get this wrong. Um, and you've got to take chances. Um, and that's going to leave you vulnerable. And that's going to leave you at times, you know, not necessarily aware of exactly how or why you feel the way you do. But um, so I get I, that that came to me when you asked that. Because right. I really like people to, to leave with that kind of permission that that's the case. Right. And so then for you, what is that creation of the safe space? So mm -hmm. how, how do you go about creating a safe space with students or actors if you're directing um, where they feel like, oh, I can I can take a chance here? Because again, uh, going to Keith Johnstone, that notion that we treat the stage like we treat life. People yeah. don't want to fail. They, they want to do it right. They, you know, and it's like, it's not about doing it right because it doesn't matter. We're on stage, right? Yeah. So how, how do you go about creating that safe space? Yeah, I, well, I think what, what, so the corny answer is you're sizing up how people are listening to what's happening. So a lot of people listen with their eyes, listen visually. A lot of people listen with their ears. A lot of people listen physically. And so you kind of, I, I just try to watch and see how the group is reacting to itself. So a lot of times I will, I'll try to create a safe space a lot of times by having nonverbal work for the first 30 or 40 minutes. Wow. Right. Uh, just not just to just to say we don't need to do anything verbally committed here. Right. Let's let's just dial into how is this breaking down physically? There's so much communication going on physically. Just getting us accustomed to that and not having anybody on the clock, not having anybody up, you know, um, right. and then easing into that. I, I for me, I find that that's good. One, there does two things for me. One, it means we don't have to listen to a lot of verbal jibber jabber that is nervous <laughs> frustration so that's my kind of selfish side and then and my and i think the the really good kind of instructive side is it permisses people to understand oh my god there's this massive vocabulary of other things going on here that is so is so much more easy to operate or you know right. listening to operate and i and i i think the other thing is is i don't i try to create an immediate culture of feedback so that I make feedback an absolute norm, um, you know, commenting on, oh, wow, yeah, that's an, that's interesting that 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 all stopped right now, isn't it? Like, you know, just calling, you know, calling things out and uh, not trying to associate too much emotional, you know, highs and lows on what we consider to be a successful effort or a, or a failed effort. Right. Uh, and just trying to ensure that it's normal to talk about how things worked or didn't work. It's normal to talk about how they affected us and, um, and then encouraging people to, to kind of feel confident to do the same. Right. I, yeah, I guess, I guess that's, that's how, that's how I look, I look at that. Um, I know what now it's very popular and very common for instructors to say, uh, we've got to really create a safe space and let's open up a dialogue right away and let's start opening up the specific channels of what is important and what is sensitive and what is meaningful to everybody which again i i totally get that and i understand the, the merit of that and i understand the comfort of that and and the respect in that i it's odd i personally never feel that i've had to be ever be that didactic about that and that's not to say that i don't now but it's just say it's i've i've always felt that uh, I've always felt that the the kind of the spirit with which things can be run can certainly imply and generate that space. Right. Uh, right. Um, well, it, it sounds like you're doing it through practice. So like by establishing the way the relationships and the practices in the room, you don't have to then stop and go, here are the, the 10 bullet point rules that we have to follow, you know? Right. Um, and right. uh, so leading by example, I guess is, is yeah. Is and, and, even, and even if and and even getting sometimes the participants to do what is in this case leading right mm -hmm. they're already doing the work so they're watching each other do some of the work and that's in that ends up being the example yeah right right so with the actors you work with in uh groomed mm -hmm. uh, or other shows or other places um yeah. you know as a director what are the things i mean I assume what you just just said is something you establish, but are there? And again, it doesn't have to be five, or it could be three, it could be one. But like, what are the key things that 
you kind of go, if you're going to work here, you need to understand that improv is about this, or this is a key to improv or a skill. Right. Um, and again, there's no set number. I'm just sure. Sure. Those. Yeah. I think, well, it does. Yeah. I would say that there, there's some pretty concrete ideas. Um, I mean, one is, I think that, you know, uh, imp improvisation is a fickle beast. And, <laughs> and, and so it's a, a I think it's about it's about understanding that that you're not always going to love the work and you're not always going to be successful with the work uh, and it's and it's tricky it's tricky to it's tricky to to become and grow comfortable with it um, and to grow in it and to improve in it and so that's one thing is that I I try to make sure that the the actors who come and work with me know that um that in our company we really expect a level of of technical dedication that 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 uh that you are kind of dedicated to it as a craft and that you're interested in improving this craft as a group as an ensemble and as a performer and and that we can we can revisit this topic and talk about how that's working or how that's not working so that's kind of one of the principles that that we'll bring somebody in with and i don't actually mind how somebody defines that so for me, I'm not into necessarily defining what that is for someone, but I am interested in an actor defining what that is, you know, saying like, I really want to get better with my more silent moments. I'd like to actually grow my my dramatic skills or I'd like to grow my listening skills or I'd like to grow my physical skills. Right. And, and it's more about the actor. It's more about the actor understanding that question for themselves more so than necessarily identifying you identifying in them. Is that? Yeah, and and if and and if they want my opinion or they want to know how I feel, I usually am happy to offer it. But I'm always interested in what motivates mm -hmm. them. Um, but I think you you know, speaking from a company standpoint, my thing is is I want people who are dedicated to this as a as a craft um, that they're that they're coming here to to improve their craft. And you know how that I'm yeah, I know you've been running an organization like this for a long time, and you know how that relationship kind of grows and wanes for people at different times um so i think that that's one thing we we hang our hat on um another thing that we hang our hat on is variety i i'm really interested in the the performers in our group i really think that it's like they need they should diversify their skills um if somebody's not particularly good uh at movement or dancing then we will definitely organize uh movement and dancing workshops and and try to improve that you know um and, and even if that doesn't translate to getting them on stage and doing a kick-ass dance, it still, it just improves and emboldens that work and, and gets other performers together in a project. Um, and I think the other thing is, is that, that we're, we're here to, uh, to perform for an audience and that we're not here to perform for each other. <laughs> we're not here to perform, uh, <laughs> For our family and friends, which is also lovely and great, and that's if that's the tertiary thing, then that's great. But the primary thing is is that we're here to we're here to perform for an audience, and we we want them to want to come back. We want them to buy you know tickets again, and and not for the monetary reasons as much as we want them to buy tickets again because they had such a lovely time that they spent their free time doing this, that uh, that we have something to say about their lives or our lives and it's relevant, you know, or, right. you know, I, I, cause I'm a big believer that the, I think the audience should vicariously be compelled, uh, at what's happening on stage, at least at points. And, uh, one thing that Keith, uh, said at one point I was working with him a couple of years ago, we were doing the life game, one of, one of his really lovely shows. I'm, I'm sure you have familiarity with it too. And what he said about this, and it stuck with me because I, I think that there's, something really relevant and, and kind of useful about this is that he really would like to imagine that the audience members go home speaking to each other about one another. And I think that's a great goal for theater. Right. So I think that that's, yeah, I, if that answers your question in a roundabout way, that's kind of where that's, that's, that's kind of where I, I try to push the, the needle, so to speak. Right, right. And do you, I mean, 
do you get a sense of that response from your audience? Because I, I know in, in our audience, I mean, we talk to people after the show mm. and it's great, but you know, what they talk about on the way home or um, what, you know, the next morning, um, I'm sort of just going off my own experience of having seen shows. I go, well, the next morning, here's how I felt. So I assume our audience feels that way. Do you get right. any direct input from your audience that shows that that's been fulfilled? Yeah. So the good news is, is that we've definitely got some very good feedback at times. And the, the trickier side of the news is that it really depends on the show. And I, I don't even necessarily mean, well, not, but I don't even just mean the performance, that night's performance. I mean the actual type of show. So, for example, we'll perform Maestro. And Maestro is popular. It's fairly easy to sell tickets to. And, uh, and people like it. We've been playing it a while. And there are some nights where I think that Maestro has such a nice variety to it uh, that it might accomplish just that. And you can tell because the audience sticks around after the show and they're chattier and they're more curious about the players and that's livelier. And there were a couple of scenes that, that did that or several even. There are nights when that's not the case. And, and there are some of our shows that I think end up being falling into the category more of folly. And, uh, and those, are, you know, those are not the nights I'm, I'm happiest with because I think there's craft in doing that too but I don't necessarily know that that's my strength. And so I think if you, you know, we'd have to, we'd have to work those in a different way. When uh, we do have a show called uh, I'll, I Will Take You Home, that's a duo show that started off with Pride Month about six or seven years ago. And it started off about, the, the format's very, very simple. Um, it's just the, the, the show simply begins with uh, a cold open, two actors walk into an apartment and it's the end of their very first date. And that's it. And then they can go anywhere in any direction to tell you the story of this relationship. It could be over three hours. It could be over, you know, seven years. We don't know, but, um, and that for example, ends up being ridiculously provocative. Now we've done that with hetero couples and, and uh, same-sex couples and all we've moved that in all different directions and use it for for many different things and that's a very very popular show and that gets resounding response because inevitably people go home after seeing usually fairly earnest warm oftentimes funny but mostly just kind of that tragic comic or touching kind of duo play and you get great responses um so i think you know that it's it's really about picking that right show and and putting the show together in such a way that you'll get that response. Right. And do you think that that's a product perhaps of having a more, lack of a better term, theatrically trained audience who are mm -hmm. used to like, oh, we're going to go see this and we might hate it, but we'll sit through it and we'll watch it, you know, versus w what I find in North America, which is like, you know, channel changing culture of like, you know, I'm done. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you think that there's more, patience in that audience i don't know if you've traveled with that show or not but um, yeah, we have yeah. um yeah we, and we have a six-man version of it too it's a little bit of a permutation that actually we've played at festivals and things like that i think so to your comment by and large i find europe uh sits patiently and watches theater uh, a little bit more uh willingly than maybe the typical North American audience. I don't necessarily even know that they're more savvy, but they're certainly more patient and they're certainly more kind of aware of what the, you know, what the commitment is, right? right? And, and more comfortable with that. Uh, yeah. Um, and, I, and I find that to be true. Yeah, I don't necessarily know that that's better per se, because I do, I, for example, I'm the type of person, if I'm sitting in the theater and after 15 minutes, I don't like the show, I usually am the person you want to leave because I get antsy in my seat and I'm like, my wife hates going to the theater with me, hates it, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I can be, you know, I don't know if it's my attention span or not, but I, I can be antsy. But yeah, that's my finding in Europe. With that being said, I think it's changing. So hmm. our audience, as our audience grows younger, so we, there, there was a huge sweet spot for us. We kind of, and this was about 19, this 19, 1913, no, this 2013, 2014 to about 2018. We had a really pretty nice sweet spot in that 
our our audience was generally kind of young, you know, bright, optimistic about their careers. A lot of young, kind of uh, uh, ambitious women. A lot of men following these young, ambitious women into the theater, and that and the shows were pretty fun and progressive. We had two really, really popular shows uh, that kind of became cultic hits in the city. So they became an event. You know, we played them once or twice a month, and it became a, kind of an event. You had to be there. It was hard to get tickets and. It was that kind of ideal situation for me as the artistic director. You love that. And, and that generated a lot of, a lot of buzz and that was really good for the, the company. But as that group aged, right, they aged out of the theater going age because maybe they were 26 to 36 and a lot of them started having a kid or they started doing something else. So those, the night shift and we needed to get younger again, we needed, we needed to come up with a show or two to get a younger audience again. Right. Um, just for that particular show, because we have audiences of shows for many different audiences. Um, but I felt when we went back and found another show, we were already dealing with a different generation um, on, on what they wanted from a show, um, how they what they what they were looking for uh, from a show I could already tell had had shifted. Um, so and that's kind of when the pandemic came in. So we'll we'll see. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, it's a, it's always an interesting question, I think. Right. And who do you think, I mean, in my mind, improv is about a snapshot of today. It's about, this is what it's like to be alive right now. Mm -hmm. um, who do we send that message to? Is it about developing and cultivating young audiences? Right. Or is it about sort of uh, expressing what, life is like for an older audience of sort of summation not summation because that's cryptic but <laughs> <laughs> you know so come here and die here you know, uh, yeah. you know so i don't mean it that way but i mean I know, I understand. Uh, where, where's that audience in improv mm -hmm. you know um, i think yeah it's a great great question i because i just thought of i'm hearing myself talk about this previous audience and i i know the specificity of it because there's, you know, you're trying, for me at least, I'm trying to blend that artistic integrity, relevance, doing it, you know, sending a snapshot, sending that, where, let's, let's be, let's talk about how we are all feeling about this right now. And you guys are feeling something like this too, right? That's like, you know, we're communicating that to the audience. And, and I think that there's a lot of drive to make sure that, are we sending this to a young relevant up and coming audience relevant in that they're young and they're kind of learning they've got their fingers in all of this right now but you're absolutely right there's this huge other experience going on for many many different groups of people and so you know a lot of times what i'm speaking about there is that those people have time at night those people want to buy tickets they want to go out and they want to do this but right. you're right there's there's the 40s the 50s the 60 year olds who have stories and they've got a lot of vested uh, interest in all of this right and i i think you're right and that's that's why i think it's interesting can you find a universal show um there probably are some that that work pretty well um in my experience we have almost always ended up kind of with a particular demographic audience um you know regardless if if and i think we set out to do that once or twice and i think we did not set out to do that the rest of the time <laughs> and we still ended up with a fairly readable demographic, right. but I, but I do think you're right. And I think you, you might be onto something there. Cause that, I do think that you want to be talking about what matters and what makes us feel a certain way right now. Right. And I think that includes everybody, right? It's just that we don't always feel exactly the same way. You know? right. Well, and I've had older performers, maybe you have, as well who um from the performance side who kind of feel like well i'm in my 60s nobody cares what i say you know the audience doesn't care and i'm like but your voice is so important because even if you're performing for a group of 20 somethings or you know early 30 somethings you can say this is what it's like to be 60 something yeah and it's you know and it's you know it's their life so um i said that's an important voice to have because it's not just about being hip and pop culture and, you know, and all the current things that are happening. It's really about just sort of that broad life. 
um, the arc of life, I guess. I, yeah. Yeah. So, I, so. I totally agree. And we, that that's one reason why I thought we, one of the foundations, one of the founding principles of our theater company was, is that we would have auditions every year and, and it would be an open, it'd be an open story and that there were players in the company. And once they were taken into the company, then they are part of the company, but we have a conversation every single year, at least to check back in, where are we? Do we, are, are we still where we want to be? Are we working with the people we want to be working with? Do you want to be here? And also the window opens that new people come. And it's basically for this very reason that I, we want to be able to, to age. We want to be able to get older and we want to be able to get younger. If we have to, we need the spectrum. And I find it very, very true. We had, we have an, one, of, one of the older actors in our company has been in our company from the beginning and he's, he's, he's 60 and he has it. He found an incredibly vital voice. Uh, there, one or one of the shows that we had, he be, became an absolute like beloved performer in the show. And it was for, and I really do believe it's for this very reason you're speaking about is that he was transcending something about experience to, in this particular case, a bit of a younger audience. And, uh, and he had, you know, he had a very good skill at kind of tapping into that. Right. And so I think, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think it's, you know, I'm a big believer in variety, the theater, <laughs> especially for improvisation. Cause like we get, trapped, <laughs> we get trapped in these re repetitive vortexes and uh, it's nice when we spread that out. Yeah, no, I totally agree. In fact, that's why I say all the time about variety. So people are like, oh, Randy, you don't like the shirt for game and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, an evening of stupid games is a waste of time. A couple of stupid games with other stuff is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's that's what I strive for. Yeah, I love it. I think that should be like, I don't can that be like the alternative title? <laughs> an uh, uh, <laughs> a, a couple stupid games. games. <laughs> and other more relevant content. <laughs> was, yeah, I mean, you have to have the variety, the, you know, I mean, gravitas, seriousness, drama, but also comedy. And, and something I've worked on in teaching, you know, I did a serious improv class. So serious improv. I didn't really change any of the content from what I would normally teach. And we spent the first half hour actually talking about comedy because it's like, wow, it's not all serious. You have to have that laugh, you know, even in the most desperate times, um, you have that lightness that, that occurs. And so I love that when I see that in improv. I do oh, want to take, yeah, no, go ahead. No, I'm, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I find that the two are totally inseparable. Right. For me, at least, even as a viewer, especially. Right, right. Um, you are a, a musician. Uh, so I also want to talk about the crossover between those two crafts uh, mm -hmm. in terms of for you, um, sort of where the intersections are between improv and music, mm -hmm. um, you know, and. Uh, I mean, music at its most base level, I guess, is math. But yeah. <laughs> but where does improv creep into that, and how do you utilize improvisation in your in writing songs, singing, playing music? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Fortunately, quite a bit. Uh, I think I often say this, and I, I I'm willing for this to be wrong, but I I do kind of feel this way. I think music is the perfect performed art. And that, and, and it, because if, if you want to get away from it, you have to leave the space, right? You can't, like, if I don't want to see people performing on stage, I don't, I just turn my head, right? right. But music, it's, it's insidious. It's going in your ears, no matter what. Right. And the other thing about music, I think is, um, it's so emotional and it's so immediately emotional and it's very undescribable. I think that a lot of times that emotion that it generates. So it, it ends up being a very powerful medium. And for that very reason too, that when music sounds poorly, or it is, let's say played, dare I say played poorly, it's, it can be very, very frustrating, right? And so I think it, to improvise in music, 
there's a requirement of certain physical acumen that kind of has to be basic. Um, and that's not untrue of improvisation on stage. That, that's not what I'm saying. But I do think that improv on, improvisation on stage is much more forgiving. There's a lot more, there's a, there's a lot more time to let things to develop, right? Because mm -hmm. repetitive dissonance is, is in music could be very, very frustrating, but in, on stage, it could actually end up taking on a whole different type of meaning. Um, okay. And I think uh, with that being said, I think that performing with a group of people and improvising or, or improvising parts of what you're doing, it's done very similarly or almost exactly the same it is as it is on stage with other actors. And that's just through generosity and listening and just being extremely attentive uh, to the others. And then kind of having that group sympathy working in that just having a basic or general understanding of, are we making enough space for everyone here? And am I hearing everyone? And am I witnessing and experiencing everything? And do I know when I, would it be helpful for me to be decisive? Would it be helpful for me to be flexible at this moment? Would it be helpful for me to pronounce something right now? And having that kind of epistemological humility of knowing that, right? Like to, to, to make those kind of choices. And, and, and I think number one, that it, it's not, it doesn't feel that unlike being in an improvised scene. Um, and I, yeah, I think creating music, like writing music through improvisation, I think is fantastic. Uh, and I, very similar to devising theater. I think it can be great to, to devise written scripts from improvised scenes as well. Um, but it, with music, it can somehow be a little bit easier because there's an immediacy of, we can improvise something, record it, or we can improvise something, stay in it, and then start repeating and changing it and morphing it very, very quickly. Um, so there's something about the speed of it uh, that's a little bit different as well. Because I've, I've devised theater, and that sometimes is videos and a lot more working parts and then revisiting going back. And that can happen with certain quickness, but we can write a song through improvisation sometimes in 15, 20 minutes and, right. you, and, and have something that you really love, you know? Um, so that's, that's not a surprise. Right. Do you feel that, um, let's say you had not discovered improv or found improv. I mean, you would do that anyway as a musician, but how do you, how do you, for yourself in your own specific journey, um, how has improv in a way sort of informed you in this process when you're making music? Mm. Uh, is it, is it kind of like dare to fail? I'm just going to go ahead and try and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Or are there particular lessons that you got from various improv sources that somehow feed you when you're making music? Mm. Well, one thing I take from it is that not everybody improvises like you do. So, <laughs> and it's really, really valuable to know that because I know that from the stage and I know that from theatrical improvisation and, and that's okay. I love, we, not always, it's great, but not every, not every musician improvises like you do. They don't improvise with the same things in mind. Right. And uh, that's actually ended up being immensely valuable uh, to me on stage because there's a group here there's an or company here that called random trip and they've been performing improvised concerts weekly in hungary since 2009 or 10. i've been part of that group for a long time I'm one of the repeat performers there and that that has just gone through a fantastic evolution still with that being said we're going a lot of times i'm playing with a couple of musicians i don't know very well or haven't played with very often or at all and it's yeah, I would say the skills from theatrical improvisation help a lot there by by me just trying to really truly listen for the for what these people want, right? What is what is what is it that's moving them or driving them? How do they feel about this and how can I contribute to that? Maybe, you know, and, and another great skill is uh, stay out of it. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't enter that scene, you know. Mm. Don't enter this song right now. That's a really lovely thing to know. Um not, and here's one thing that I think theatrical improvisers learn sometimes a bit quicker than music, musical improvisers is silence. <laughs> a 
a lot of times musical improvisers uh, really are happy to have the instrument in their hands or whatever, and there's a lot of playing going on. Right. Um, so I, th- I, th- I think that that's, that's valuable. Um, audiences, they, they love the fact that they think there's no net. That's, I think that's, that's what I find in both. And for me, I don't actually completely think that that's true. I actually think, I, I don't think that there's a net per se, but I actually think that the risk of it all going wrong is very low. Yeah. That's, is it the risk or is it the consequences? I, I may, yeah, I, well, that's a great question. I would say the consequences are not great, even though it would probably be very, it could be uncomfortable, I suppose. I actually think the risk is low. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I always think there's there's a song in there, right? There's it's like there's a scene in here that we're trying to excavate. You know, there's a scene in here. There's a song in here that we are trying to find. You know, that we're trying, and we usually will find it. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. I it's very very liberating to improvise concerts on stage. It's a, it's a really, really amazing feeling. And I think that it's one of those things that goes down as I qualify as a good circus trick. It, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. It looks perilous. It seems incredibly exciting. Certain song, lots of songs, some songs are better than others. Right. But, but it's, it's actually with just being focused and joyful and, and listening, uh, it's actually pretty easy to do, right? That's that's yeah. That's that's kind of how I sum it up. Right, right, right. And um, it's a uh, when things go wrong. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> Both on stage and in music. But I'm curious about the music thing because I'm not a musician. So I'm curious. Does it feel the same? Or are they two kind of different beasts that you kind of have to write out uh, mm. whatever's not working? So, you know, when you're improvising music and it's like, ah, whatever, it's not working, audience isn't into it or whatever. Is it the same feeling as when you're improvising on stage? Uh, yeah. I think there are, there are likenesses uh, in that in that it can, it could, I suppose it could feel awkward and it could feel like uh, we've somehow we're, we're, we're distant from, we're either distant from the audience or we're distant from each other. And then that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel like we're working well together. Uh, with music, um, if the level of competency, and this is kind of why I went back to improvising music can be a little bit different than improvising on stage, because if the level of like physical competency with the instrument is at a certain basic level, then yes, there will be errors and yes, songs can go wrong. But the the work kind of can always sound somehow coherent, right? It just might not be honest or true or exciting or wonderful or whatever, but it can kind of be coherent. And then it, I guess it feels, music can get very territorial. That's that's one thing I that I would say, and a lot of times that to me is when it feels the most uncomfortable. <laughs> and maybe maybe improvised theater is that is that way too. When when actors get a bit worried or nervous or vain or so frightened that they they start to to push hard through scenes, I think musicians do that as well. And that to me feels uh, that both times they can feel pretty pretty awful <laughs> um, to be on stage. But I think I think, for example, improvised theater will end up a little bit more cringy uh, than improvised music will in those moments. And that's I, I might be wrong on that. Right. Well, it seems, and I'm wondering uh, again on both fronts, theater and music. Kind of going back to uh, Keith Johnstone's idea of this idea, like you know improvisational theater should be have you know have these incredible highs and then these amazing colossal failures <laughs> and yes. and if everything kind of works then you're playing it safe right so i'm wondering how does that play out in in you know improvising music or or playing music i guess 
Yeah, I I think it that is a, a dead on um, analogy for me, uh, and you can feel it in concerts because you can you can almost feel. We, for example, when we improvise these these concerts, we usually improvise two sets, not always, but usually, and you can almost number one one of the sets will be superior to the other usually hoping that it will be the second <clears throat> right that's you're, you're hoping it will be the second and within all of that within all of that there is usually a segment of both sets but certainly one of them that is particularly uh joyful that is particularly free that is particularly you're 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 lost you're immersed in the joy of it all you can see that the audience is is lost and immersed in the joy of it all that the the musicians are seeing and hearing each other but they're lost in their playing and those are really you know for lack of a maybe more specific or better word that those are really kind of transcendent moments and those are really great highs and you can hear the immediate response of an audience the, the screams and shrieks and whistles and the body movement and that sort of thing and with music, you have a couple built in things, you can tone things down and put a ballad or put something more emotional in there. So you can actually change moods very, very quickly, very deliberately, just tonally, and rhythmically and tempo wise. And then you, you've got to go for it. Sometimes you have to, you know, you'll end up with this huge drum fill to suck, cat, 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 cat. And then the band doesn't follow him. And then it ends up being like this, somebody fell down a pothole or something. Right. And I, I I agree with Keith wholeheartedly here. It they they frame all of these different moments frame each other perfectly to be exactly what they are. Right. Uh, right. Well, yeah. and what you just said, I kind of go, I would love for theatrical improvisers to hear. Because <laughs> to me it's totally accurate. It's like uh, we need to throw in the ballad once in a while. <laughs> we need yeah. to, you know, respond uh, accordingly. And that goes back to the variety um uh, point about like oh if it's all just you know this then you know um and I, what i do in class actually um is use music and i say you know think about your favorite band when you see them in concert it you know they shake it up or they do a different version sure they play their greatest hits or whatever but then here's some new stuff and here's a slow song and here's a different arrangement of a song you might know and that kind of variety in terms of that so i mean but i thought you summed it up really well in what you just said so part of me wants to go i'm gonna record that and show it to my students yeah, but I mean, yeah, this, is, this is this is like a you know universal property here i i but I, I know that about i know that about you and I, I i certainly remember hearing you talk and i i really feel like we feel very similar about this and i and i i hope that other artistic directors or directors and actors in improvisation really take their own version of that as time goes on because i think i i think that this craft there's so much that can be done with this craft and there's and i really think there's a this is probably corny to say or been said too often yeah. but there's so much untapped potential in improvisation and i i know mm -hmm. that you felt that way for for many years and it's and I just think that it this is the key. It's exactly this. It's it's being willing to get stuff wrong, uh, and because that's probably the only way that you're going to find stuff that you like and that that strikes a tone with people. And it's and it's mixing it up, right. and getting good and getting good at mixing it up. And what I mean by getting good at mixing it up is just having an idea of what mixing it up is and having a notion of how that works. You know, a lot of times that's why. I, Get these guys dancing. I want my actors to, to to know how to have fun and dance. I want my actors to to know how to change the tonality on stage, you know, tonally, physically, verbally. If we just had a bunch of love scenes, let's get out of the theme of love, you know. Let's <laughs> let's get to, to you know. Let's get into the theme of you know whatever insurance. I don't know, but like you know, it's like something else. <laughs> Really, insurance is the opposite of love in your. <laughs> I'm just looking at something I need to sign. Over here. Okay, I'm beginning to understand more. <laughs> Trying to follow me. Right. Yeah. And I would add that it's being open to those possibilities. Yeah. Because if you can't be open to it, it's never going to happen. 
So, right. you know, going back to what we were talking about uh, in terms of, um, I, I think it was in music you were talking about, but also about on stage improvisers. If I'm so protected and trying to protect my ego so much that I can't open up to something new, I have to do the things I always do, then it's it's never going to happen. It's, you know, because it's not, a, I don't even see the tool, you know, let alone know how to use it, um, I feel. Um, so to me, it's about trying to find that way to open stuff up and for people to feel safe going way back in our conversation, um, creating that, that level of safety where people feel like it's okay to take that chance. And right. if it works or doesn't work, okay. Well, and it, it's like, it's, it's our, I guess maybe if I can rethink maybe one way to, to answer that question when you posed it, like it's, it's to, it's for the actors to know that actually that's the definition of their work, <laughs> right? It's a, it's the definition of your work is not necessarily come here and do the stuff that you're best at doing. Right. The definition of your work is actually come here and try to find uh, different ways to get voices and get feelings and get moments out on stage. Right. Um, and, and we've got to be willing to, to stretch our capacity for that. Right. Yeah, that's Agreed. it. <laughs> that's it. We just did it. That's there it. you go. We solved it. <laughs> we solved it. It's over. <laughs> um, so you and I were talking beforehand, and you said Grun Theater is doing some outdoor shows hmm. coming up. But what kind of work are you looking to bring back initially uh, yep. as Budapest opens up? And whether it's the outdoor show shows or the indoor shows that eventually will happen. Yeah, well, the indoor, so the outdoor shows, we, we've got a couple of variety uh, shows that we'll do uh, in the summer, and we have a few organizations that we work with. So our I Will Take You Home and uh, the After Party, which is a permutation of that, they, those are things that we travel with and take that. We have a, we have a children's show uh, called, uh, like, what is it called, Morsels or something like that, where it's just like, it's a, we often, we'll play that once or twice in the summer as well. It's kind of an interactive, uh, what is it, like fractured fairy tales type of type of show. So most of that, our summer stuff includes that. What we'll have back on stage from the fall is uh, we will have uh, Food Film Fighters, which is which is one of our really, we, it hasn't been on stage for the last two and a half years. We'll, we're, gonna, we're gonna bring it back with a, with a new cast. And it's basically, there is a film that we're thinking of that we haven't told the audience what it is. And they are going to, uh, they're going to be treated to different guests who will speak about their variety of expertise. So in other words, a makeup artist might give a talk, um, a writer might write a piece uh, uh, or a critique about it. Uh, maybe a poet will write a fable or a poem about it. Uh, somebody will come in and talk from a photographic perspective about it. And then in the meantime, the actors are taking inspirations from these talks and chats they, the actors don't know the film either. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, we're playing scenes, we're setting up scenes and we're playing scenes to see if the audience can guess the film. Right. And, uh, and we serve food and all that uh, at the, in the meantime based. Or, uh, so that's like a very elaborate big show, but that, that's a beloved show. We're gonna bring that back to one of the theaters that we work with this fall. So that's exciting because we're gonna have the new young actors in the cast playing that for the first time. Um, uh, and then, uh, we'll, we'll have Maestro and we'll have our other two standard shows coming up. And then I'm looking to get something new on stage, uh, this, this year. And, uh, and we're thumbing through a few ideas, but, um, I was thinking of trying to get something a little bit interactive with some video cameras, uh, monitor, and maybe a couple of different varieties of of space to where we can do something and the the preliminary title is an evening with terrible people <laughs> <laughs> and, but i i don't i don't know if, i don't know how many tickets that's going to sell yet so. <laughs> i don't know if we're going to basically they, they had a play called yeah, Ivan the Terrible. I thought we could ah. get away with it. 
Right. Well, most people buy the tickets would be like, I guess I'm a terrible person because I'm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. if, exactly. You're exactly. Everybody's incriminated. <laughs> cool. Oh, we've gone a bit over, so I oh. appreciate your time. Um, and uh, yeah, I love talking to you. We should do this more often. Um, Absolutely. But um, uh, I'd like to thank Andrew for being here. And again, if you're ever in Budapest, uh, check out uh, the theater, Gruen Theater, and um, look for that. Uh, and also their uh, festival, which may be happening some point it's probably going to happen again next March. So we're looking right. forward to that. And Hungary has another festival going on in mid-August in yeah. Jura, which is a town just about an hour outside of Budapest, a lovely place. So there's there's some things going on here. Cool. And we'd love to have you back. So hopefully oh, we'll see you. I would love to come back. That would be great. Yeah. I loved it. And in fact, uh, I will say uh, one of my favorite memories of being in Budapest was coming to your house and telling jokes with your son at the kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> it is a pretty good pastime i have to say as, as 15 year olds go he's a pretty good person to tell jokes with uh, yeah it was, i loved it it was great um so you can do that uh if you <laughs> yep. yeah, you're Just welcome to do that andrew a call uh so. Anyway, and then again, if you um, want to see a live show at the Market Theater, come on down. We do shows uh, four times a week. Again, we're going to be expanding. But right now, it's Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and uh, Saturday. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday uh, mm -hmm. are all of our live shows. Uh, and then uh, we're not doing an online show right now, but we will be in September. So look for that. And um, we have classes. Again, if you enjoyed what you've heard, um, or even if you didn't, uh, feel free to go to unexpectedfilmings.org and uh, make a donation. So, um, and yeah, I guess that's it. So thank you, Andrew. Yeah, thank you so much, Randy. I had a great, great time. And everybody, Unexpected Productions is an outstanding organization and one of the flagship ones in the world for this craft. So if you're in the Seattle area, check it out because you guys have an absolute gem Oh. in your neighborhood ah, thank you yeah. <laughs> all right we'll see everybody later